This video is powered by patrons. See the link in the description and learn how you can support videos like this. Desmond gave his life so the world could carry on as it was, but not quite as it was. A malevolent force once entombed in the fabric of the Grand Temple has been set free. Set free by one touch from Desmond, the act that ended his life. All that remained from that moment was Desmond's lifeless body, and hours later, that body was claimed. The subject displayed burns to the right hand, severe enough to fuse the bones, indicating some kind of spontaneous, intense burn trauma. Abstergo had been tracking the assassins, and that trail led them to their prize. Not the assassins, not the apple, but for what the body contained. Desmond's DNA. Thanks to the work of Abstergo Sample Recovery Unit 3, the legacy of Subject 17 will continue uninhibited as Sample 17. Sample 17 contains, for the Templars, the lives of some of the most important people in history that came into contact with important objects of power. Altair unlocked the secrets of the Apple. Ezio helped decipher those secrets, and Haytham and his son Connor found the amulet to open the Grand Temple. Abstergo know that these pieces of Eden and First Civilization technologies can only strengthen their control of the world, and they'll stop at nothing in procuring them. They have spent a great deal of time, money and energy tapping the value of Desmond Miles. But there is one more ancestor of notes that Abstergo could profit from. This man led a life of adventure, action, intrigue, great riches, and soul searching. The life of the pirate, Edward Kenway. This is the seventh instalment in my story summary series of the entire Assassin's Creed franchise, and you can view the previous six in the playlist linked below. I'm a video game storyteller. I'm currently focusing on the Assassin's Creed universe and the mammoth task of retelling the stories that exist within it. I've also told stories within other great video game worlds, and you can view those in the description below. If you would like to support this work, and view my videos, often months in advance, head over to Patreon and view the posts page to see what you could get exclusive access to right now. Make sure to subscribe, hit the bell to be alerted of my next video, and before you leave, please, make sure to like this video to help it reach all those it might interest. And down in the comments, tell me which is your favorite story in the Assassin's Creed franchise so far. Mine might just be this. I'm the Patient Wolf, and this is the story of Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag. With great power comes great outgoings. Abstergo are a corporate front for the Templar Order, an ancient group hell-bent on ordering the world as they see fit. To fund this endeavour, Abstergo have many legitimate cash cows to keep these wheels turning. They started in the late 1930s in science and pharmaceuticals, and in their history expanded to finance, technology, fitness, telecommunications, and in 2010, Abstergo Entertainment was born. By 2013, their primary objective was to turn genetic memories heavily edited into pre-packaged entertainment products to sell through their console, Animus Omega. They had already released one small-scale experience entitled Liberation, featuring the life of the misguided assassin, Aveline de Grand Pré. As long as they have the samples, they can tell its stories, because they don't need subjects anymore. They don't need a live mind to tap into. A technology long developed alongside the Animus project, the Surrogate Initiative, now perfected, uses DNA from anyone to be accessed by anyone for long periods with reduced risk. And on floor two of the brand new Abstergo Entertainment building in Montreal, Project 17 has numerous employees scouring the ancestry of Desmond Miles, recording material for impactful stories for the masses all the while, mostly unknowingly, searching for tools of control for its masters. Just such an employee 
is being put through their paces on their first day at Abstergo Entertainment. Look up. Their name is not important. It's what they discover that's important. It could be anyone. It could be you. It could be me. It's we. And we have impressed Melanie LeMay, a senior executive of Abstergo Entertainment, our main point of contact in our new career. You're very good. The data streams are very stable. So, welcome to the Sample 17 project. The building is state of the art, with vending machines and restaurants offering its staff unimaginable choice. Coffee shops, elaborate plant and water features, and a central elevator housed in an aquarium. Can you believe how beautiful this building is? We are given an earpiece and a tablet named internally as a communicator. Power it up and give it a look. It's pretty slick. It holds your messages, notes, data, access keys, and tracks your position within the building. Your communicator is your key to getting around. We ascend to the second floor to commence our new life here. Ah, there's the boss, Olivier Garneau, our CCO. I'll introduce you. Bonjour. What project? Edward, the pirate. Ah, ar, yar, matey. <laughs> Very exciting. Welcome aboard. Everyone's so friendly. Melanie, the boss Olivier. Our colleagues seem engaged too. Not everyone seems happy though. This pair of legs is John, one of the wizards in IT. He's just fixing something for you. Not fixing, calibrating. Calibrating, right. So here we are, your very own Animus workstation. This is all yours, so sit back, relax, and find us some good footage. The cubicle is all ours, a space of our own to decorate our way. There's even a wall of trinkets given as bonuses by Abstergo for good work. We've got some catching up to do in comparison to our more experienced colleagues though. And this is Animus Omega, no longer accessed with the subject lying down, we can now sit upright with the Helix headset and experience the lives of anyone as long as we have a descendant's DNA. Time to get to work. You have been registered as part of the Sample 17 project. Your primary research target is Edward James Kenway. Cape Bonavista, June 1715. Edward is a pirate, and this pirate ship has bitten off more than it can chew. The English Navy's mandate is to bring pirate ships to heel on sight, and the English were winning. It was through the hail of cannon shot and shards of splintered wood that Edward first saw what he later came to know as an assassin. His bearing, the silhouette of his clothes, his posture and gravitas. An image so striking to Edward because he spent his life daydreaming about becoming such a man. To rise above his dirt poor upbringing and show those in and around the Bristol taverns he once frequented, to people that looked down on him that Edward Kenway is a man of quality. And to Edward, this man embodied this. Douse the flames! Get in there, you mongrel! Edward had never seen such swiftness and speed and that blade that protracted from the wrist. Why was Edward so transfixed with this surreptitious steel? Edward had not set out to be a pirate. He left English shores through the Bristol Channel with one hope in mind, to come back dripping with gold and the status that brings, to be respected and to win back his estranged wife, Caroline. The shame of it was, Edward had her. She loved him for who he was. She came from wealth and power and status and all she wanted was him. They lived on his parents' farm. She helped with the chores. They lived in the outhouse. She was happy, but he was not. He wanted more. We don't need a fortune. It's not about need, Caroline. I want a decent life. And to fund this decent life, privateering was the buzz around the ports. Militia men of the sea, given carte blanche by the crown to attack Spanish ships and keep the plunder therein. But the war between the English and the Spanish was cooling. And two years into Edward's stint at the sea in the West Indies, privateering ships were outlawed. If the practice was continued, you were a pirate. Not sanctioned by a government, but hunted and Edward's ship had been hunted. His captain killed, his vessel destroyed. 
He is alive. Oh, was it good for you as well? I must get to Havana. I can pay you. Isn't that the sound you pirates like best? You don't have that gold on you now, do you? <laughs> Bloody fucking pirates! He's a man of quality, yes, and he might have money. And that blade, that mesmerizing blade. Edward Best's The Hooded Man. On his person is a glass trinket, papers including maps and a letter. Senor Duncan Walpole, if you truly possess the information we desire, we have the means to reward you handsomely. Though I will not know your face by sight, I believe I can recognize the costume made infamous by your secret order. The letter is signed, Governor Lorino Torres. Edward has a plan. The blade won't function as demonstrated. This may give him away. He begrudgingly disposes of them. The clothes fit perfectly, like he was born to it. His shoulders naturally pull back. He feels a foot taller. He feels as good as this man looked. It's as if by putting on these clothes, Edward was saying goodbye to his old life. He's now a man with a second chance to become something and maybe the means to become it. Mr. Walpole, let's collect your reward. He just needed a way to Havana. The gunshots on the horizon heralded that way. My crew and I had merely anchored to water and resupply. A bumbling merchant named Steed Bonnet had been caught up in the conflict that marooned Edward and the English have commandeered his ship and detained his crew. Edward had always been good with the sword. Fighting came naturally to him, but something about the garments he now wore and the glimpse of effortless majesty and stealth he saw in Duncan Walpole led to Edward adopting a silent economy to his kills. By God's grace, sir, you saved me. A profusion of thanks. There was an urge to save this man from the English, but a greater urge to earn passage to Havana on his ship. I'm Duncan. Steed, Steed Bonnet. I'm on a secret errand for His Majesty the King, and I must get to Havana with speed. Steed was not made for the waves. He needed Edward to pilot, but he did yearn for adventure. Ah, there's a tug of the wind at my hair. Ah, I find a bracing comfort in the feel and smell of the ocean. The high seas as a plantation owner ferrying his wares was a start for him, but he romanticized a more adventurous life. And with Edward at his side, he may soon find it. Havana. 1715, founded by the Spanish 200 years prior. The capital city of Cuba and a bustling port of trade. Mad to think Spain and England were at war two years ago, isn't it? The English welcomed back after the war's end to boost that trade. Here, money is king and anyone that hampers the flow of that is an enemy. Convicted pirates are sentenced to die slowly in the gibbets, in full view of any ship docking, a warning. Those former privateers heeding that warning would languish, spending what they had in the city's taverns. I'm English myself, biding my time till the next war calls me to service. While waiting for Steed to make his trade, Edward would join them. Edward had always capped his waking moments with alcohol to celebrate small victories, more often to drown his sorrows and bypass the pains he felt of not being the man he hoped to be. <laughs> He frequented the taverns as a young farmer. He did so when the honeymoon period of his marriage to Caroline waned. And as he knew he could not find a way to keep Caroline as his ego thought he should. Two years later, and on the verge of what he hoped would be a big score, he takes a drink in this tavern. I've seen your face before. Use mates with them pirates down in Nassau. Edward, is it? Edward's face was known because, as the Treaty of Utrecht was signed, banning the practice of privateering, Edward turned pirate under the charge of some known pirate faces. Edward's former captain and mentor was Edward Thatch, and Thatch was in turn mentored by Benjamin Hornigold. And it was these names that made the famed Pirate Republic of Nassau their home, an island that Edward also called home. But here in Havana, he was not Edward. He was Duncan Walpole, a 
and he could do without this. Escaping the attentions of the Spanish law enforcers, it's time he focused on the task at hand. Before he does so, he says goodbye to his new friend. Will you stay here long? For a few weeks, yes. Then back to Barbados, to the tedium of domesticity. Don't settle for tedium. Sail for Nassau. Live life as you see fit. Oh, God. That would be an adventure. But no, life can't be all pleasure and distraction, Duncan. The name's Edward, in truth. Duncan's only a handle. Secret name for your secret meeting with the governor. The governor, right. I think I've kept him waiting long enough. It would turn out Steed would take Edward's advice and turn to pirating himself and for a time find the adventure he so craved. It was a meeting he would be grateful of. Your constant friendship has been my most treasured find on these seas. I prize the courage you have inspired in me this year. Thank you, sir. This gratitude lasted until his death in 1718, where he was hung for piracy by the Crown. Edward arrives at the Governor's mansion in his new disguise. Mr Duncan Walpole of England to see the Governor. I believe he is expecting me. Duncan Walpole would not be the only guest of the Governor. There would be others at this meeting. Woods Rogers, a pleasure. Woods, a former privateer himself, now charged by the English Navy to help rid the world of pirates. He is joined by... Julien Ducasse. An arms dealer. I hope your conversion to our order is an honest one. I have no love for assassins, but even less for liars. Was Julian onto Edward? But at least Edward had a name for the ancient order Duncan belonged to, as referred to in the governor's letter. Duncan was an assassin, but looking to defect... Duncan, where are your wrist blades? Ah, uh, damaged sadly beyond all repair. Julian had evidence for how little love he had for assassins, but a gift for Duncan. Where did you find all these? I took him. He's a souvenir. Edward felt born to these tools. He instinctively knew how to fit them, how to wield them. They seemed to guide him as he bonded with them like long-parted relatives. These additions further instilled the sense that he was shedding old skin. He wasn't Duncan, he was Edward, but new and improved. But for now, he was Duncan, until he could get what was coming to him. Grandmaster Torres, Mr. Duncan Walpole has arrived. You were expected one week ago. Apologies, Governor. My ship was set upon by pirates. Were you able to salvage from these pirates the items you promised me? Uh, yes, sir, I was. Come, gentlemen, we have much to discuss. Duncan Walpole was a disgruntled assassin and was using these secrets and artifacts possessed by the West Indies Brotherhood of Assassins to grease the wheels of transition to an order in opposition to them. A group Edward had never heard of, but as he would soon find out, long knew of their power. Edward was about to be inducted into the Templars a group that spans the world and here in this part of the world has influence within all governments, the British, the Spanish and Portuguese. The secret and true legislatures of the world, please hold out your hands. Edward had seen the cross that adorned these rings before, the last time, not long before he took to sea. Caroline Scott, the woman he impressed enough to call his wife was from a rich, influential family and her father opposed the marriage, withheld a dowry, and persisted in trying to split them up. This Tuspat is a ruined man, Caroline, unfit for life on land, much less at sea. He did not know the name of the order Caroline's father, Emmett Scott, belonged to, but he used his influence within it to aid in ridding Edward Kenway from his daughter's life. Emmett wore Caroline down to return to the family home. He also used his connections to warn Edward away for good by setting fire to the family farm and beating Edward. He agreed to leave for the West Indies but vowed to return a man of means. He left with a souvenir, a scar from a ring worn by Emmett's associates in the shape of a cross. He recognised that ring and that cross here. As far as Edward was concerned, this group had hurt his family, driven a wedge through his marriage. These were not the friends he wanted, but he wasn't leaving without his reward. 
and in waiting for this reward, he was to hear what the Templar Order sought most, to track down an artifact that would galvanize their power and help them truly control the world. For more than two decades, Lorino had been entrusted by the Templar Council to find a mythical device known as the Observatory. A device that would grant us the power to locate and monitor every man and woman on Earth, whatever their location. This is the Observatory's promise, and we must take it for our own. They do not know its location, but they have the key to it, and that key may know where the door is. For the key is a man. The Templars call a sage. It has been 45 years since anyone has seen a true sage. What is a sage? The Templars seem to know, and as the ceremony comes to an end, we are invited to meet him the very next day at the very place Edward arrived, the Havana Docks. Here he is, a man both Templars and assassins have sought for over a decade. The man is named Bartholomew Roberts, and it's his blood housed in the glass vial procured by Duncan Walpole that will open the door to this observatory. Edward notes nothing extraordinary about this man so revered apart from his differing coloured eyes that demanded attention. We have the key. Now we need only its location. They can force the blood from him, but they cannot force its location. He will be transferred to Lorino's villa so they can work on extracting it from Roberts forcibly. This has been a whirlwind for Edward. In keeping up the pretense, he has had to bottle his surprise at some of the things he is hearing. Templars, assassins, the precursor race, superior beings that lived thousands of years before, leaving behind knowledge and devices. It's so far beyond Edward's understanding of the world that it does not bear study. He has more terrestrial concerns like his reward. It's as he looks to ground himself from these lofty concepts that the assassins strike. As he defends the attack and slays the hooded aggressors, he's not defending Governor Torres. He is defending his outstanding prize. The assassins are here for the sage, but the sage opts to choose his own freedom. Stop him! Edward returns the sage to the Templars. Well done, lapdog. Quiet! And finally gets his due. I consider this the first payment in a long-term investment. I would like you to be present for the interrogation tomorrow. Call around noon. The Templars disperse. Woods Rogers is to leave for Britain. He hopes for his own reward from his country for the work he is doing to rid the world of pirates. His own governorship here in the West Indies. Edward is far from happy with what he's received. He wanted a clean break with a fortune, but Lorino seemingly has further plans for him. Edward has no love for the Templar cause. Why should he assist them further for such scant reward? Edward resolves to take the prize of the observatory for himself, to free the sage, to convince him to divulge the observatory location and sell it to the highest bidder. Free the sage for the riches, yes, but Edward has never held with the sight of a man in chains. Always a pirate at heart, freedom is a state held dear to Edward. Spanish bodies, what's happened? Whether the Templars had deduced before or Edward's mere presence at the sight of the escaped sage had revealed him, they knew he wasn't Duncan Walpole. What is your true name, rogue? It's a uh, Captain Pissoff. Where is this sage? Did you set him free? I had nothing to do with that, much as I wish I did. Take him to the ports. Send him to Sevilla with the treasure fleet. Edward is shackled in a ship bound for Spain. Torres does not wish this imposter dead. He is to send him back to the Order back in Spain who can aim to extract more from him. Besides, the ship is bound for Spain anyway. On it are all the riches collected in the West Indies headed for the motherland. Gold, silver, as well as prisoners. It is with one of these prisoners that Edward masterminds his escape. In finding his weapons, Edward sees the piles and piles of Spanish gold headed for Europe. Just a trunk of this would allow him to return home with his head held high. But his life and his freedom are more valuable at this moment. They emerge on deck to the beginnings 
of a storm. It's a hard wind coming! Edward and his new friend resolve to free the other prisoners, steal one of the more nimble ships and make for the horizon, away from the bloated Spanish warships carrying their annual boon to the motherland, away from this devastating hurricane. The stolen brig can outrun it, but the remainder of the Spanish fleet cannot and would sink along with its riches to the bottom of the sea. Edward had lost the fortune in his grasp, but he had won the next best thing. He had taken a ship for his prize and a skeleton of willing men as his crew. Edward didn't set out to be a pirate captain when he left Bristol two years before, but he was one here. His new friend Adewale would be his quartermaster, himself the captain of what Edward would name the Jackdaw. A sly bird I loved as a child back in Swansea. And where does any free ship head to, to rest and recuperate? To the free Pirate Republic of Nassau. All hands aft, lads. We're taking this one home. It may not look it with its shanties and dishevelled populace, but to a pirate, this was paradise. Rich in food, resources, materials for ship repair, easily defendable with its narrow cove and shallow waters, and the fort's high vantage point could see aggressors coming from miles away. Here you could almost kid yourself that the pirate age would last forever. Here you could be free. By God, you're a sight for salty eyes. Come you in and have a drink. Edward knew this island well, and he knew the founders of this pirate republic. His mentor, Ed Thatch. Thatch's former mentor. Ben Hornigold. And another pirate. James Kidd. Who's this? Adewale, the Jackdaw's quartermaster. <laughs> you named your brig after a poxy bird. Despite the teasing, these men want the best for Edward. They know what he's capable of, but they also have experience as ship captains themselves that they wish to impart to Edward in his early days with the Jackdaw. Well, I'm going to teach you how to sail all right and how to take a prize the proper way. How a ship should be tamed, approached, boarded, and taken. Lock him in the hold and take everything that isn't nailed down. Edward has experienced with and learnt so much from these men, and he learns more here. All it takes is a few drops of blood, sweat, and a swatch of cloth. So let the black flag signal nothing but your allegiance to man's natural freedoms. This one's yours, fly it proud. Edward has graduated. Here's to our pirate republic, lads. Nassau is a haven for the pirates, but with more governmental intervention on piracy throughout the world, it has received attention. British have been sighted. A shipload of the King's sailors showed up a fortnight back, causing trouble and knocking about like they own the place. A shipload can be dealt with, but what if this is the first ship of many? If the king were to attack the town, he'd trample us. Nassau is an idea men have worked hard for. It needs protection. If we're to keep our republic afloat, we'll need guns as well as gold. Edward Thatch has a plan to steal the Spanish galleon. This won't trouble the English. Position all the guns to one side and moor the ship in the harbour the first and deadly line of defence against approaching enemy ships. It will not be easy to steal a full Spanish galleon. Have you one in mind? I do, sir. She's a fussock, she is. Fat and slow. The biggest ship Edward had ever even thought of taking. These pirates' goals are lofty, but to protect everything they've built, it will be worth it. Sailing for that island. Oh, I know the place. Natural stronghold used by a French captain named Ducasse. Julian Ducasse, the Templar. I know the man. And if he sees my ship, he'll know it from his time in Havana, meaning he may wonder at who's sailing her now. Edward escaped the Templars, but is presumed dead on the sunk Spanish fleet. It would not pay to let them think otherwise. If they are to take the galleon, Edward needs to take care of Ducasse first. The jackdaw will approach the island from the opposite side. Edward slips ashore, treks the jungle, and surgically removes Ducasse. You remember the gift you gave me? 
Well, it answers just fine. Fils de putain! I'm sorry about this, mate. But I can't risk you telling your Templar friends about me still kicking around. After all we showed you of our order, still, you embrace the life of an ignorant and aimless rogue! Edward has no interest in the rantings of a Templar, but he's happy to see one fall, and the pirates happy to get their prize. The cove is ours! Yeah! A cove that Edward would soon make his home. It's been a cyclonic time for Edward since taking over the Jackdaw. He has a ship, a loyal crew who will follow him anywhere, and he has made some decent coin in the process. Despite this, he wants more. Do you ever dream of the big score? A ship so full of gold and silver, you just split it and sail home? Sure, but it's only a dream. Many of Edward's friends live the pirate life for its own sake, but for Edward, he is looking for an exit strategy. A lifetime of gold and to be the man that that makes him. He's not forgotten about the place the Templars seek. Have you heard of a place called the Observatory? Aye, it's an old legend, like El Dorado or the Fountain of Youth. What have you heard? It's meant to be a temple or a tomb, hiding a treasure of some kind. That's it, you see here. It's not only the Templar ring, Edward took away from the governor's mansion. After the ceremony, while eyes were scarce, he pocketed drawings of what the observatory is said to look like. Diagrams. Oh, rot. While the others sneer, James Kidd stays silent. It ain't a fortune, it's a fantasy. With no leads and no enthusiasm from his peers, Edward submits for the moment, but something in him will not let it go. He tells himself it's the money it promises which may be sizable. But his friends are right, there are much easier scores out there. What is it that's fueling this desire? Why can he not put this place out of his mind? Hey! Well, looks like Olivier wants to meet with you. It's exciting. We were a long time in the Animus. The trauma of long stretches in the machine have been lessened with each iteration of the machine, but we need to acclimatise before we meet the boss. We have taken to Edward's memory like a ship to water. We synchronise so effortlessly. This is the best job ever. I mean, look at this building, this view. What a way to synchronise with the present day. This is John from IT. I was calibrating your Animus. Do you have a minute? Oh, ah, oh. oh, damn it. The tracker says you're on your way to Olivier's office. I'll ping you when you're done. I have a favor to ask. Go right in. He's waiting for you. Hi, thanks for coming in. I know you're busy. So the main reason I asked you here concerns is something called the observatory. We know it well. I'd like to encourage you to focus on locating this specific set of memories as soon as possible. Some bigwigs at Abstergo Industries have been hounding me for days. So, follow whatever leads you find and hopefully we can... Oh, incoming call. I have to take this. Why is this so important to this corporate umbrella? Did they know about it before we did? Edward's obsession is now ours. It makes for a great adventure anyway. Hi, John from IT again. You got a second? Uh, a colleague of yours left for vacation this morning and forgot to send a video file she promised me. I was hoping you could help me. We're itching to get back to the Animus, but we're happy to help. John gives us an increased security clearance, and we log on. Now, you need to bypass the core to find the data inside. Isn't this hacking? John is IT, so we guess it's okay. The file is a post-mortem report of Desmond Miles. He's the guy whose memories we're experiencing. Why do Abstergo have access to this? Taking samples from dead people, this doesn't look legal. What have we got ourselves into? The file is on our communicator. John instructs us to hand it off to a courier waiting downstairs. The courier in animated discussion with the coffee guy. I followed that recipe to the letter. It's an art, Sean, not a science. They must know each other well. Oh, look who's here. My poor Rebecca here wait for nearly 30 minutes. So, how should we do this? Data transfer? Great, that should do it. What are we into here? Corporate espionage? Maybe it's our curious nature that makes us so good at memory retrieval. Why we're flavor of the month here at Abstergo Entertainment. But that curiosity, coupled with this access John has given us, is overwhelming. We must know more. We hack our colleagues' workstations as the rabbit hole deepens. Voice recordings from Desmond's cell phone before he dies. 
his kidnapping by Abstergo, historical figures from the past purported to be Templars, decades-old covert recordings of early Animus prototypes and research, reports on ancient devices and phenomena linked to a precursor race, this mysterious concept we witness Lorino and his Templars speak of. Why do Abstergo want these files? With John's next call, we find out. Do you have a second? Of course you do. I have another job for you. We're too far in now. John raises our access. This time we hack the cameras. Olivier and Melanie conferencing with an Abstergo higher up. Her name? Letitia. And if we want information on assassins or Templars or the observatory or whatever the fuck else interests us, Olivier, you will deliver it. Your entertainment products are simply a means to pay the bills for larger and more important work. We have our best employee working on this, but it will take time. Until then, I'll see you at the shareholders meeting, Olivier. Tabarnak! Did you know that Abstergo was run by Templars? Oh, yes. I'm curious about this shareholders meeting, though. How about you break into Olivier's office and see if you can find his schedule? Oh, what? You don't like that idea? I own you! We hack Olivier's desktop. John? And now the courier has the location and the date of this Abstergo shareholder meeting. It's in Chicago on the 15th of November. Thanks for this. We'll be in touch. Who are these people? And what is this company we find ourselves working for? And how many of these employees know how deep it goes? It's pretty certain Olivier knows about Abstergo's link with the Templars, but does Melanie? What is clear? As the wool is pulled from our eyes, we are starting to hear discontent within the company's staff. Unhappy at the level of scrutiny, control. They confiscated my animus key, and now my position here is under review. Some talking of moving to other corporate giants to work like Bloom in Chicago. I'm just not happy here. Not really. We return to the sanctuary of the animus and sink into its mysteries once more. The cove at Great Inagua was perfect for Edward and his crew. Much like Nassau, it's shrouded from the elements and easy to defend. Here, the Jacktor could have a base to truly make its fortune. Perhaps build a fleet made up from the ships we take and send them on trading routes to bolster the crew's income. The cove also has existing infrastructure they can build upon to really make it their home. I will make something of it in time and a grand mansion left behind by the late Julien Ducasse with all the decor and trappings that a Templar arms dealer could accrue. All this impressed Edward because it could impress others. It could impress Caroline. Might even convince my wife to come one day. You're married, are you? She left me some time ago. Keep that fact hid away. Most of these pirates don't respect a man with higher commitments than rum and plunder. Edward had a respect for James Kidd and sets him apart from the other pirates in his mind, like a riddle that he can't begin to work out. James is quiet and reserved, but Edward senses an attention from James that teeters on a knife edge between exasperation and fascination, as if he sees something in him that Edward doesn't care to see himself. While Edward is interested in the island's riches to come, James is interested in the riches of its past. Odd looking things, aren't they? Old and weathered. The Maya, the civilization that spanned this corner of the globe, had in recent centuries receded under Spanish conquest, but left behind the ruins of their culture and clues to their mysteries. The Stellas, stone structures that pointed the way to keystones dotted around the West Indies in islands like this. Clamber on top of this thing here, will you? James used this discovery to prove something he had long suspected. Edward was gifted. He could effortlessly access the gift inside us all. Eagle vision. Most never find it, but for a rare few it comes as natural as breathing. Any man's senses can be tuned well past what he's born with, if he tries. Since before Edward can remember, he has felt different to the others. Felt like he has seen the world in a different way. Yet he's never been able to find his place in it. He's never been at home in his own skin. He has worn the skin of a farmer, a pirate. These clothes that once belonged to an assassin, an assassin about to become a Templar. He tried to fit into all of these personas, often using a good drink to smooth the passage. Sometimes 
believing it himself. We're pirates, kid. We take as we please and become who we like. James Kidd knows different, and is frustrated Edward can't see otherwise. It's not who you are. Who am I, then? All I know is you like dangerous prizes. Like the observatory. I think you know more about that than you let on in NASA. Meet me at 20 degrees, three minutes latitude just off the coast of Yucatan. I'll have something to show you there in a few weeks' time. What Edward finds is an island populated with Mayan ruins and what looks to be assassins. He eventually finds James, who, good to his word, has secrets to share inside the ancient ruins. Captain Kenway. This is Atabai, the mentor of the West Indies Brotherhood of Assassins, and James Kidd is an assassin amongst them and he has been so for a couple of years. I met Atabai in Spanish town, and there was something about him I trusted, a sort of wisdom. The West Indies Brotherhood have been established since the early 16th century, as Europeans populated the area. The natives of this new world had a philosophy like our creed, and when Europeans arrived, our group sort of matched up. But there's something in the Assassin's Creed that crosses all boundaries, a fondness for life and liberty. The assassins here do not have a fondness for Edward. What is the assassin, Duncan Walpole? Dead and buried after he tried to kill me. We are not sorry to see him gone, but it was you who carried out his final betrayal. When Edward handed over the coveted glass vial to the Templars, he also unknowingly handed over the location of every major assassin stronghold in the West Indies. The Templars now have the upper hand. It's only a matter of time before those with this knowledge land on these shores. You murdered our brothers and sisters in Havana. He has the sense, mentor. James tells me you treated with the Templars there. Did you see the man they called the Sage? Aye. Would you recognize his face if you saw it again? I reckon so. Inside the Mayan ruins, behind layers of gateways and fail-safes sits protected an ancient cast. A cast that shows us the face of every sage that has ever graced the earth. And what Edward sees is Bartholomew Roberts, the ordinary man with the extraordinary eyes. You're certain it's him? Aye, it's the eyes that mark him. We're finished here. Was that the man you saw in Havana? Spitting likeness, aye. It seems another sage has been found. The sage is confirmed but the island is under attack. This is your doing, Captain Kenway. The maps you sold to the Templars have led them straight to us. The Templars have taken the island and the crew of the Jackdaw hostage. Off the coast of the island awaits a Templar associate. See that mangy old codger? He's a Dutch slaver called Lorenz Prinz. A man looking to enslave and profit from those he can with this Templar knowledge. Knowledge given to him by Torres, who has also given him a special task. Bastard's been a target for years. They need to free the captured and drive them from the island. Take this. You'll attract no attention. As Edward gets used to the added stealth the blow dart affords, he and James clear the Templar-controlled soldiers, free the pirates and assassins and drive the slave ships of Lawrence Prince from the coast. The assassins safe again for now. Captain Kenway, you have remarkable skills, but you're churlish and arrogant prancing around in a uniform that you have not earned. I absolve you of your errors in Havana and elsewhere, but you are not welcome here. He's not welcome here because of what James Kidd saw and hopes to change. Edward thinks only of himself and the prizes he can win. Despite everything he's seen, his compass is set firmly towards riches, and him wearing the assassin garb is an insult to those that cherish what it stands for. James thinks Edward can set a different course, but until then, he wants to keep him close and keep him busy. I know you ain't exactly impressed by our creed, so would the sight of money make you more friendly to our ways? Work these contracts around the West Indies for us, and we'll pay you as simple as that. Just like magpies, jackdaws are attracted to shiny things to add to their nest, as is this ship's captain. Upon the body of Julien de Casse, Edward found a key, a key to a locked closet. Four more keys would open it to gain access to this Templar finery. The keys reside with four 
Templars. They've been sent to kill these four targets. Hang me, that's the map I sold to Governor Torres in Havana. You think maybe you owe them a bit of warning then? Edward will work with the Assassin's Bureau there, stop the Templar threat and collect the keys. The prize awaits. As it does in collecting the buried keystones littered around the islands of the West Indies. Within it, Mayan armor made from an array of first civilization material, said to aid in deflecting projectiles. Things are good, but money is better, and Edward and his crew take it wherever they can find it. Discovering chests, diving for lost treasure, catching prized creatures of the deep, Look at the size of him! taking on ships, and robbing plantations where resources are plentiful. They can trade those resources or upgrade the ship, the integrity of the hull, the power of its weapons, and with every improvement, they increase their ability to take on bigger and more lucrative vessels. We'll make it a point to keep this ship and its crew in fine condition. The Jackdaw is a successful pirate ship and Edward Kenway, its pirate captain, Come all you young sailormen, listen to me I'll sing you a song of the fish in the sea And it's windy weather, boys, stormy weather Boys, when the wind blows, we're all together Boys, blow ye winds westerly, blow ye winds blow Jolly sou'wester, boys, steady she goes By the beginning of the year 1717 There were some new faces in Nassau to experienced pirates, ex-privateers and old acquaintances of Edward Thatch. You're welcome to Nassau, gents. Everyone is that does their fair share. Jack Rackham and his captain, Charles Vane. And they don't arrive empty-handed. They are keen to team up with the famed pirates of this island and have news of a job. The word is, Cuban governor himself is fixing to receive a mess of gold from a nearby fort. Until then, it's just sitting there, itching to be took. Lorino Torres, the Cuban governor and the Grand Master of the Templars, will be at this fort to pick up this gold. What the gold is for is less important to Edward than the desire to take it. Sticking one to the Templars and the chance to see what they know about the whereabouts of the sage. Attacking the fort opens up a whole new avenue for the pirates. They learn to attack others like it, not only for the riches it contains, but in the conquering, easing the passage of the jackdaw to further, more profitable waters. At the fort Punta Guarico, the pirate crew incapacitate the firepower, scale the walls, take out the hierarchy, and locate Torres in the war room. Well, hello, Your Excellency. So, What's a Templar Grand Master doing so far from his Castillo? I'd rather not say. And I'd rather not cut your lips off and feed them to you. Two years ago, we offered a reward for the sage's recapture. Today, someone claims to have found him. A slaver by the name of Lawrence Prince. He lives in Kingston. This gold is his ransom. We like this story, Torres. And we want to help you finish it. But we're going to do it our way, using you and your gold. Torres will meet Prince in Kingston, Jamaica, and when they make their trade, Edward will be there to take the sage. The hunt for the observatory is on, but also tracking Prince is James Kidd. Prince, an assassin target for years, he will have his prize. He is persuaded to hold off until the handover, but Prince senses being tailed and takes flight. Deal with this! No sage. Torres makes his escape also. James cannot let Prinz evade his blade again. Jim, stop! I can't let you kill those men, kid. Not until I found the sage. When I locate the sage, you're helping me take Prinz. Got that! And James does locate the sage at the plantation of Lawrence Prinz. James has a plan. There's too many guards to go in quietly. Edward will cut the warning alarms and James will disguise himself to trick the guards to open the gate. Except it's not a disguise. It's the removing of another. Your name's not James, is it? Not most days. What's your real name, lass? Growing up, Mary found dressing as a man allowed her to live her life her way. 
In the West Indies, she went by and dressed as James, but to those she held dear, Mary Reed to my mum, and them I call friends, but not a word of it to anyone, or I'll unman you as well. Please, I've been shot. I need aid. Mary opens the plantation gates. Edward finds Prins. You absurd cutthroats and your precious philosophy. You live in the world, but you cannot make it move. You mistake my motive, old man. I'm only after a bit of coin. <laughs> As was I, lad. Prins dealt with. The sage will be more difficult. He has Mary. I remember you. We've come here to save your ass from this slaver. Save me? I work for Mr. Prince. Well, then he's a poor man to call master. He meant to sell you out to the Templars. Oh, you can't trust anyone, it seems. <laughs> Robert! The sage eludes him again. The assassins flee. And the months drip by. No leads. Edward knows that draining tankards in the old Avery Tavern won't bring any, but he does it anyway. He always has. It's how he has punctuated every disappointment in his life. Edward has hit a wall. Many pirates in Nassau feel the same, none less so than Edward Thatch. He has seen his star rise over the preceding couple of years. His name is on the trembling lips of every merchant, sailor and government official in the West Indies and beyond. But his given name, less than the name his legend has come to call him, Blackbeard. Why fly a black flag when a black beard will do? Fire! Edward was used to working for his prize, weakening the ship with cannon fire, boarding the ship to clashing steel and taking lives in order to take the plunder. For Blackbeard, his legend was often enough. Sailing his ship, Queen Anne's Revenge, under the absence of colour, the sheer sight of his flag was enough for many ships to capitulate. Appear to be the devil, and all men will submit. Those that didn't had to face the terror of this black-bearded devil who placed lit fuses under his hat, producing an aura of hellish fire. Showmanship was a weapon he used well, and profited greatly because of it. But on his return to Nassau, he does not see those same symptoms of success. Nassau is hurting. The promise of freedom has come at the expense of organisation, cooperation. Sewage and detritus are ill-attended. Rats line the ramshackle streets and disease is taking hold. Edward is more able to ignore it up in the old Avery, through the haze of ale and the sight of the new barmaid, Anne Bonny. A rum flip this time. And where'd I find fresh eggs in this wretched town? There's little else but piss and insects. There is something else upsetting this pirate republic. It's a ruse to keep us off before they attack Nassau. It's no ruse, Vane. There's a pardon on offer for any pirate that wants it. To Charles Vane and Thatch, to even think of giving in to those that wish to strip their freedom is mutinous. But Benjamin Hornigold's head is turned. Look around you, man. Is this cesspool worth dying for? Aye, it's our republic. A free land for free men. But when I look on the fruits of our years of labor, all I see is sickness, idleness, idiocy. I can't believe the shite I'm hearing drop from your lips. Why not take the pardon now and be done with it? With the news of this pardon, the British are soon to follow with firepower to enforce it. They can do nothing but wait for this. All they can focus on is what they can control. And Nassau needs healing. They need medicine in great supply. They can't steal it and rile the British, so they try the Spanish Rex. To no avail, the supply is ruined. Blackbeard is impatient to get Nassau healed. He cares not for the British circling its waters. He takes action to get the medicine against the wishes of his former mentor, Ben Hornigold. It were Blackbeard who struck first. Open fire on a British man of war, the pillock. But he's gone bar me if you ask me. Edward Kenway is concerned he might be right. He aids Thatch in taking the man of war and retrieving the medicines, but it's not nearly enough. But the medicine we found bears a Charles Town stamp. Edward Thatch does not stop at taking a British man of war. He'll do anything to save the Republic he forged, even taking men of Charles Town hostage to get what he needs. 
hostages for ransom. These were my only terms. What the hell are you doing, man? All of Charleston can see this mess. It's the idea. Desperate to limit the damage and ire of the British colonial powers, Edward intervenes and looks to take the medicines from the town by stealth. Pirates! That approach fails. But Kenway escapes with the medicine anyway and returns to Thatch. Despite his hard-earned victory, this siege has given Thatch time to think. He can see the opposition to their pirate life escalate and the lengths he's willing to go to to overcome it. He knows where this path will lead and this apparently fearless man fears it. Edward notices the change. You're done, aren't you? Giving up on us, on NASA. Look, lad, I'm late into my fourth decade on this earth and if I don't find some means to make the fifth, quiet and cozy voyage. I'd rather sink to the devil's doorstep than call myself captain another year. Reel me again, lad. In this world, or the one below. Edward returns to distribute the medicines in Nassau. And it's while in the old Avery, the rumor of the impending pardon becomes a reality. It's headed by a face Edward recognizes. The Templar, Woods Rogers. He has returned to the Caribbean as governor and is in charge of ridding it of its pirates. The pardon is his method to achieve this. British ships have blockaded all other ships from leaving the island. One man is quick to welcome them. Verily, you are a man of principle, Captain Hornigold. A man I believe I can trust with my best ideas. What the hell is Hornigold doing? Lily livered punk! Edward keen not to be recognized. I pray you take the prudent course, gentlemen, and accept the king's pardon as soon as your hearts allow. Look on this as a stroke of fortune, lads. We should take the king's pardon and salvage what oh, dignity we peace. own. They'll be hanged before I surrender to that bobbin. We had here a rare opportunity, but in two years we pissed it away. I won't make that mistake again. You'll all be dead men, bastards! While Hornigold has made his choice, Vane, Rackham and Kenway make theirs. They won't stay here a prisoner to Her Majesty. They steal explosives, rig a ship and break the blockade. <laughs> Burn you bastards! Nassau is done, but they are still free for now. They head north. They need their pirate poster boy back in the fold. But despite Vane's efforts, this pirate is not for turning. A great disappointment you are, Thatch. And hang all of you lot that follow this sorry bastard into obscurity. Now with Nassau done in, I feel I'm finished. I'm not of the same mind, mate, but I won't begrudge you the state of yours. You still looking for that sage fellow? Aye. I heard a man named Roberts was working a slave ship called... The Princess. The Princess. Cheers, Thatch. Well, don't sit there like a barrel of wet fish. We're celebrating my retirement! <laughs> Thatch is to hang up his hat, never to darken the horizon again. But he has ruffled too many British feathers to go quietly. The British have tracked him and his crew down. They attack. Under fire, the pirates man the ships. Thatch delaying his retirement with one last naval battle boarding the British ships, taking British lives, cementing his legend. To Edward, Blackbeard was a hero. He was his mentor, helped shape him as a man. He may have killed for gold, but he also killed for freedom. His friend, Edward Thatch, would live on in tales that stretch far beyond these waters, and for a long time to come. We'll drop him down with a long, long row, and we say so, and we know so. Where the sharks will have his body and the devil will take his soul. Oh, poor old man. Devil damn the man he was fierce, but his heart was divided. It's hard to let go of the life. Vane. 
Kenway, their icon had gone, but their work is yet complete. Right, Kenway, this observatory you're always going on about, how do we know it exists? We find a slave ship called the Princess, aboard to be a man called Roberts. He can lead us to it. The plan is to look for slave ships on the open ocean, any working for the Royal African Company. Engage, board, and interrogate the officers for the location of the princess. This captain claims the princess sails out of Kingston every few months. All right, we'll set a course. But it will be a long while before they make it to Kingston. Lads! Ah, see, uh, the boys and I had a bit of counsel, and, um, well, they figured I'd be a fitter captain than you reckless dogs. I'll cut you another cut, try, sir! Ooh. <laughs> this one I figure I might sell for a tenner down in Kingston, but uh, with you two grog blossoms, I can't take any chances. Tie them up! Rackham takes the jackdaw a prize, Adewale to profit from, and leaves Kenway and the incandescent vein stranded on the no longer seaworthy ranger. I'll gut you, Jack Rackham! I'll open you up! I'll tear out your organs and stray your bloody loot with them! Shut your gob! It was a while until the ranger found land. They eventually washed up on Isla Providencia. Maybe it was the trauma of the betrayal of his crew, the malnutrition, lack of water, or it was a psychosis that had been a long time coming. It was your bloody imagination that landed us here, Kenway, and you was the reason Jack Rackham took my crew. Charles Vane's blame drove him to distraction. Edward feared for his life. It's either himself or Charles. Because I'm not going to say it again in a world cursed by your ugly bones. You goddamn fucking knave, Vane! Don't save me a spot in hell, Shanka. I ain't coming soon. There's no saving Vane. He's lost to insanity. Edward commandeers a schooner and sails for Great Inagua, free again once more. Charles and Edward would meet again months later. Vane later found and captured as a pirate and left to rot in a Jamaican prison. Night, mate! Never to recover from the psychosis that gripped him. Best of luck to you, mate. I wish we'd parted as friends. Jack Rackham didn't last long at the helm of the Jackdaw, detained here for now. Adewale and Kid retrieving it and returning to Great Inagua, where Edward would be reunited with her. So what now? Still chasing your elusive fortune? I've heard the sage is sailing out of Kingston on a ship called the Princess. Put your ambition to better use, Kenway. Find the sage with us. I've no stomach for you and your mystics, Mary. Edward forever consumed with his lust to be respected, to have enough to feel enough that he has spent no time thinking about the hard things, about a philosophy, adopting a code. The assassin mindset has not spoken to him, and the Templar one, with its order and control, certainly didn't. One could imagine he could have travelled home, gold in hand, to Bristol months prior, to show Caroline his success, to share in it with her, if she'd have him. Desire may have been joined by shame. All he has now is this elusive prize, the observatory, but why will this make him? Adewale has seen this obsession spiral for months. I grow tired of chasing these fantasies of yours, Edward, as does a crew. Hang in there, man, we're getting close. While in Kingston, hoping for a sight of the princess, Edward catches wind of a Templar and an old friend, Woods Rogers and Benjamin Hornigold. Hornigold having taken the truce and now taken with the philosophy his new friend espoused, Benjamin was now a Templar. Edward was saddened by Hornigold's complete defection, but surprise was an emotion lower down on the list. Although he was there at the inception of the Pirate Republic, it was a freedom he wanted to shape and ultimately control. He dressed apart from the others, more naval captain than pirate, and he was quickest out of all of them to consider the king's pardon. It wasn't the pirate life for him. He found another that suited him more. If you don't mind me asking, sir, what's the meaning behind these blood samples we're taking? Torres tells me that blood is required for the observatory to properly function. Does Torres mean to spy on me then? For I've just given him a sample of my blood. As will all Templars, it is a measure of insurance. And trust, I reckon. Although the Templars have no idea of the location of the observatory, they are preparing for the day they do. 
taking samples of their own and any important powerful figure they can. Knowledge of these people's actions is indeed power. They are about to ship these samples to a safe house in Rio de Janeiro, ready for the day they can wield this power. They are there to meet Torres with news. The princess was taken by pirates six weeks ago, and so far as we know, the sage Roberts was still aboard. And Ben Hornigold, their new loyal naval captain, will lead the search for the taken vessel. It was last seen off the coast of Africa. Uh, remind me, where in Africa are we looking? Principe, sir, a small island. Hornigold spots a ship in the harbour he knows well. Edward Kenway, have you heard all you came to hear? A pox on you, traitor! You sold us down river. Because I found a better path. The Templars know order. Goodbye, old friend. You were a soldier once, when you fought for something real, something beyond yourself. They must leave these shores to Africa. Edward needs to find the sage. And there, through the evidence of a skirmish, he does. Captain Kenway. Roberts was a carpenter on the Princess. It was taken by pirates, but he managed to negotiate a spot in their crew. This ambitious pirate captain had bitten off all he could chew and finally succumbed to an ambush by Portuguese Templar soldiers. I warned him not to go ashore. Bartholomew Roberts has been evading the Templars for years, trying to keep a low profile, but he decides to stop running from Kenway. I see now there is no escaping the Templar's attention, is there? I suppose it is time to fight back. I do like the sound of that. And I know just how I'll do it. Edward would have to wait to be inducted into the plan. For now, he watches on as Roberts claims the position of captain of the princess. He is impressed in his short time with the crew. Bartholomew Roberts is a pirate captain, just like Edward. And he's finally able to ask him the question he wanted to ask since that night in Havana. I'm looking for the observatory. Folks say you're the only man that can find it. Folks are correct. I have no secrets to share with you now. But if you'll lend me your aid, you'll get some answers, I promise you. Sail to this location. Bring only those you trust. The plan is set. The flagship of this fleet is transporting a valuable treasure in a large chest. Crystal files filled with blood. I want those blood files intact. And if that does not happen, we part as enemies. This ship contains the blood of all the Templars that are hunting Roberts down and more besides. All the samples they, Torres and his men, have managed to take. Edward boards the galleon and secures the vials. <laughs> Woods Rogers, Ben Hornigold, even Torres himself. You so must take me to the observatory, Roberts. I need to know what it is. To what end? Will you sell it from under my nose? Or work with me and use it to bolster our game? Whatever improves my lot in life. A merry life and a short one, that's my motto. All right, Captain Kenway. You've earned a look. The Jackdaw meets the princess off the coast of Long Bay, Jamaica. The site of the observatory. We'll cast anchor and meet ashore. You were followed, Captain Kenway. It's Hornigold! Edward has brought the Templars right to the sage. Once a hero, now an enemy. Edward looked up to Hornigold. He cherished his counsel. Their paths crossed through Edward Thatch, who mentored him. It was watching Hornigold on the water that Kenway learned to perfect his sailing. And it was these skills that run Benjamin Hornigold aground. He would follow them no more. You could have been a man who stood for something. What have you done since Nassau fell, huh? Nothing but murder and mayhem. You flew in with the very kind we once hated. If you continue on your present course, you'll find you're the only one walking it. With the gallows at its end. Ah. Ah. Bartholomew Roberts is now free to share his secret, and Edward free to receive it. They convene on the shore of the sacred site. Why is it you alone can find what so many want? I was born with memories of this place, like another life I've already led. Curse you for a lurch man and speak some sense. Despite Edward's frustrations, Edward had some sense of what it meant to be a sage. In his travels, he came across diaries, 
of a man who died just over a decade prior. He claimed to be a sage. He was hunted by Templars, Torres in fact, marked as a sage due to his piercing heterochromatic eyes. Just like Roberts, this man Tom Kavanagh knew he was born different, had flashbacks and memories of another life entirely, another race entirely, memory of a love lost, a love longing to be rekindled. Like Roberts, he knows this place, knows what to look for having never seen or heard of it from anyone in his lifetime. On the island, Tom met a people, who on seeing his eyes dropped to their knees in praise. The Tiano tribe had been charged with protection of this sacred site 150 years prior by another sage, this very same tribe who lie in wait for Edward, as he is asked to clear the way towards the observatory by Roberts. Tom Kavanagh spent many years with the observatory, with the Tiano tribe, and on his death was buried here in a ceremony of great reverence. In stark contrast to the reverence this sage, Roberts, shows for them, choosing to have them killed rather than presenting himself as the next sage. Perhaps it was quicker this way. Time spent with Roberts was often like a mirror held up to Edward, a mirror in which he disliked what he saw. They are both Welshmen from poor backgrounds. Roberts ran his ship well as their new pirate captain. He had opportunity to converse on occasion during their time and looked to discern a personal calling within this man so highly prized. He found only a relentless lust for hedonism and yearning for adventure and power. Roberts saw people as a means to pursue this lust. A merry life and a short one, that's my motto. No men are sheep. That an old wolf like me deserves every ounce of blood he draws. Knowing what he knows, why was Edward trusting him here? He could not see past his desire to know what it is. Edward has seen many ancient sites on his travels, Mayan mostly, but this is different somehow. Crew members carrying the Templar blood vials. All it needs is a drop of my blood. Jesus, Roberts, have you gone mad? These wags would have gone mad at seeing what lies beyond this gate. But you, I suspect you're made of sterner stuff. Now, pick up that chest and carry it hither. He's come too far now. Look at this place. Scale and architecture he could not have possibly imagined. Corridors lined with blood vials. These cubes contain the blood of an old and ancient people. The blood in those files is not worth a single real to anyone anymore. It may be again one day, but not in this evil. Those familiar spheres, outlined in the plans he stole, Edward is here at last. Ah oh, yes, a security measure. Just a moment. So what is this place? A device, capable of seeing great distances. This is bloody witchcraft. No, this is Mr. Jack Rackham, somewhere in the world at this moment. Placing blood vials in the crystal skull at the center of the spheres allows those present to see through the eyes of the owner of that blood, through Jack Rackham's eyes. Rackham forgiven for his mutiny, Edward sees Kidd and Anne Bonny at the old Avery in Nassau. Kidd and Rackham are pirating together, trying to persuade Anne to join them. But you have to want it and work for it. There's no stumbling into true success. Hey, that's my last you're making love to. Up your ass, Rackham. The blood of Woods Rogers sees a meeting with Torres. They plan to take more blood in lieu of finding the observatory. This time the blood of the British Parliament, tricking them to supply blood as part of an induction ceremony. You must get a sample from each man. We want to be ready when we find the observatory. They would have access to the secrets of one of the most powerful empires in the world. A precious tool, you see. Sorcery, that's what it is. Every mechanism that gives this device its light is a true and physical thing. Ancient, yes, but nothing supernatural or strange. We'll be masters of the ocean with that. Oh, such ambition. You played your role, but our partnership is done! You're a dead man, Roberts! With the way blocked, he must ascend, emerging with an impossible way down. His ship 
has retreated under threat of Robert's crew. Oh, your jackdaw's flown, Edward. That's the beauty of a democracy. The many outvote the one. I know the king's bounty on your head is a large one, and I intend to collect. Have you ever seen the inside of a Jamaican prison, boy? Have you? This isn't our cubicle, our workstation. Where are we? Hello? If you're anxious, that'll pass. It's the midazolam. I'm sorry about this. We've had so many security breaches, we were forced to take drastic action. And Olivier is missing. He left for Chicago two days ago, but no one's seen him since. I know this seems excessive, but rest assured, we will compensate you when the hacker is found. Take care. While we were in the Animus, they drugged us. We should have read the small print in our contracts, though they are in their legal right to detain us. What if they find out it was us that supplied the meeting schedule? Is Olivier dead? Was it our fault? What have these guys done? <laughs> so, I think we need to erase all the dirt they might have on you. John imbues us with level three clearance. We witness through the CCTV as he leads Melanie away from the server rooms. Now's our chance to purge our involvement in this mess. The scale of the Abstergo Entertainment Network is enormous. Surely they don't need all this server space. <laughs> Here we are. I'll update you communicate one more time. A little program I cooked up just for this purpose. There we go. Try it out. Juno. Lingering in networks and nodes, the nervous system of the world. When Desmond touched the pedestal, Juno was free from her shackles, and her essence, her consciousness, could leave the temple after 80,000 years. She made her way here to the mainframe of Abstergo, a network so large she could hide here, something that can keep her, help make her stronger, perhaps hitching a ride through Abstergo's visit to the temple shortly after Desmond's death. We bless Poor Desmond, who gave his life so that you, the children of our labors, would live on to fulfill your purpose and ours, in mine. Her goal is to inhabit a human host, to transfer to a being made flesh and walk amongst her tools of domination. John is just such a tool, here to facilitate this transfer, earmarking us for this purpose. But thankfully, not just yet. We are too strong and Juno still too weak. Now is not the time. My strength is not sufficient to inhabit an organic vessel. There is more work to do, more samples to acquire, more artifacts to find before my will can obtain. Make me whole again my instruments. During our moments of curiosity, hacking our colleagues' workstations, listening to their gripes and worries, we came across little notes written diatribes from a member of a secret ancient group. Not an assassin or a Templar. The instruments of the first will. A group with knowledge of the ones that came before, a group accepting their role within existence as always and forever being a tool for their ascendance. We were invented by them, so we belong to them. John is just such a member. He knows of Juno's existence in the digital world, and as her instrument, his service was to help her become a part of the flesh world, to truly start her reign. This is the symbol of that group. How many members are there? And is that courier, that barista, a part of it too? John's purpose was to be realized in this moment, but not to be. God damn it! She should be here! Now! Living in that goddamned head of yours! Why are you still here? We leave the server room, not oblivious to the fact that that could have been our last act. Surely, to populate the consciousness of another being, ours would have had to have been eviscerated. Back in the holding cell, nothing to do but wait. We miss Edward. It's been over six months since Edward was handed over to the British, incarcerated as a pirate, malnourished, starved at daylight, whiling the hours with his memories, some of fondness, some with regret, most of Caroline. The Templars know he's here, of course. They will use torture to extract the location of the observatory. He knows he won't talk. 
despite they speaking of her. She's a beautiful woman, I am told, but not at all well these days. If you touch her, you bastard, i The Templars brought Edward here to witness a consequence, if he doesn't talk soon. Edward heard tales while in prison of the pirate crew of James Kidd, Anne Bonny and Jack Rackham terrorising the British Navy in Caribbean waters. But their reign had come to an end, like many pirates. You, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny! are to go from hence to the place of execution, where you shall be severally hanged by the neck. We're pregnant! Do you all hear that? Anne's child fathered by Rackham, now hanged. Mary Reed, from a young man in their crew, killed at sea. What the devil did she say? If what you claim is true, then your executions will be stayed, but only until your terms are up. Then I'll be up the duff the next time you come knocking. Remove them! Back to their cells. A night in the gibbet for Edward. Four months later. Atabai. Do not mistake my purpose here. I have come for Anne and Mary. But if you would lend me your aid, I can promise you safe passage from this place. With Hidden Blade and Blowpipe restored, Edward and Atabai reached the cells of Anne and Mary. Mary? Mary, it's me, Edward. What's wrong with Mary? She's ill. And her child? They took her. Anne, still heavily pregnant, goes with Atabai. Mary, close to death from the traumas of delivery. Put me down, Edward. Go. You should have been the one to outlast me. I've done my part. Will you? If you came with me, I could. I'll be with you, can we? I will. Edward knew the frustration Mary felt in how he lived his life. How he was wasting his gifts on personal gain rather than something that helped, that endured. Perhaps he thought he might change one day. Perhaps he thought he had time. It's too late for Mary to witness it. In an instant, what he knew in his heart comes to the fore. He ran from Caroline not to better her, but to chase what he had always sought, to feel enough. Chests of gold wouldn't cure it, nor killing, nor mythical prizes like the observatory. He had always been on the wrong path. His friend was gone, the greatest mentor he ever had. Edward is resolved to seek the right path, but not today. Today he needs his old friend. One that has always been there in good times and bad. These pains need medicated. Just leave me be! Change course, Edward! Change your bloody course before it's too late! Captain Kenway! On your feet. Are they there to direct the way? And you'll be tough to know your jackdaw is still in one piece. But he has a different calling now. You're leaving. When your heart and your head are ready, visit the assassins. I think you'll understand then. He was ready. The moment his friend Mary Reed was taking from him, he knew he was ready. Ready to turn his back on his inadequacies, the painful image that he had of himself, and the image he strove to see. His ego was tamed. For years I've been rushing around taking whatever I fancied, and yet here I am, with rich years, feeling no wiser than when I left home. Yet when I turn around, there's not a man or woman that I love left standing beside me. There is time to make amends, Captain Kenway. He can start with the threat he inflicted on this island, on the assassins six years ago. He gave the Templars intel on the assassins that has caused them immeasurable losses ever since. And they are back here today. Edward stands with the assassins. There is one person left from his life in Nassau, recovering here with the assassins. She has lost her child. Everyone's gone, aren't they? Mary. Raccoon, touch, all the rest. I miss them so. Do you feel that too? I do. In May, in the year of 1721, Edward, the Jackdaw, and her new quartermaster, Anne Bonny, set off with a singular task. Not to gain riches or reputation, but to rid these lands and waters of its threat to freedom and peace. The Templars, 
and the sage Bartholomew Roberts. They need to safeguard that crystal skull. Way anchor and let fall the courses, lads. We're sailing for Jamaica. There, they meet with the Assassin Bureau and have the whereabouts of Woods Rogers. Before he sets off to deliver his end, he is to post a letter he has long been meaning to send. Caroline Scott Kenway, Hawkins Lane, Bristol. Woods Rogers is attending a farewell gathering. He is being recalled as governor by the Crown. He must be dealt with. <gasps> I've seen the observatory, and I know its power. You'd use that device to spy and blackmail and sabotage. Yes, and yet all for a greater purpose. There's no man on Earth who needs that power. Yet you suffer the outlaw Roberts to use it. In this, their opinion is aligned. Woods reveals what he knows. Our best sources say Principe. Grab your kit and pack well, we're sailing for Africa. It's there they find the pirate ship of Bartholomew Roberts. Shall we sink his ship, Captain? No. There's a device with him that needs taking. Oh, a merry life and a short one, as promised. But perhaps I was wrong about you. She might have had some use for you after all. She? Of whom do you speak? Oh, she who lies in wait, entombed. I had hoped to find her, to see her again, to open the door of the temple and hear her speak my name once more. Aita. Aita, the husband euthanized by Juno before the cataclysm that ended their civilization 80,000 years ago. The ones that came before strived to save themselves in many ways. Aita volunteered to test one of the methods to genetically modify their bodies to hardy themselves against the apocalyptic winter to come. Aita achieved only catatonia and an unimaginable pain that would not relent. Juno ended this pain, but only knowing that she may have the chance to see him again. During the ones that came before's interbreeding program where they looked to fuse some of their gifts with that of their human creation, Juno spliced and distributed the genetic code of Aita through the program. Thus, throughout time, when those pieces of genetic code aligned, Aita would be born again. A pre-civilization mind in the same mortal human body born at random intervals to different parents throughout the ages, with memories of his past, his love of Juno, and a laser focus to find and prepare for the return of his wife. A plan carefully formed before his death. Bartholomew Roberts, Aita, dies knowing that his work will be continued by another somewhere in the world, and one day he will see Juno again. Where's the device, Roberts? Uh, uh, destroy this body, Edward. The Templars. If they take me. This sage blood is destroyed, but Torres still has his original sample. They receive news he's found the observatory and is on his way there. He does not know that the crystal skull has already been claimed. He thinks he's still in the race but the Grand Master of the Templars must be dealt with. They break the barricade of the island cove, fight their way to the observatory to chaotic scenes. Knowledge of the security system soothed by sage blood is lacking in these Templar invaders, and they are perishing under its effects. Torres stranded at the altar. We could have worked together, Edward. I could show you things, mysteries beyond anything that you could imagine. Does this murder fulfill you? I'm only seeing a job done, Torres. You would see all of mankind corralled into a neatly furnished prison, dulled beyond reason, and sapped of all spirit. You wear your convictions well. They suit you. As Torres acknowledges the change in him in his dying breath, Edward Kenway's transition is complete. He is now, at heart at least, an assassin and the assassins return the crystal skull to its spherical throne. We will seal this place and discard the key. Until another sage appears, this door will remain locked. There were vials when I came here last. Filled with the blood of ancient men, Robert said, but 
They're gone now. Then it's up to us to recover them. Only after I fix what I mangled back home. The letter Edward sent while in Kingston has received reply. News that incites pain, regret and hope in equal measure. Wakey, wakey. I don't believe we've been formally introduced. Not in this era, anyway. <laughs> the face of the man we had just seen killed is here before us in the holding rooms. In the basement of Abstergo Entertainment, John, the man that coerced us into doing his bidding, is the incarnation of Aita. John is a sage. You saw my beloved Juno, and for a brief moment, I thought she might occupy this tender body of yours. But something went wrong, for the world is nearly ready for her return, wired, prepared for a second coming. Here they come, those Templars. Or maybe assassins this time. Idiots. All of them. Aita's last act is to inject us with poison, perhaps a last dish hope of weakening our body for Juno to enter it. But his body won't live to see it. He's got a gun! Guide me into the grave, beloved! I am your instrument! Drop your weapon! Are you okay? Can you hear me? Hello? Talk to me! We are okay. The poison, far from a lethal dose. Our culpability for the leaks and corporate espionage was covered up by John. Life returns to normal. But we are forever changed. This company has secrets and goals that need uncovering. They know the location of the observatory, but the power it yields is not their priority. The surveillance technology they have developed over the years more than gives them that power. Perhaps it is the vials that they search for. The vials of pre-civilization blood. It's not clear what the Templars seek, but they need to be stopped. And we know just the people that can help us do it. My name is Sean. And uh, back there is Rebecca. Since they left the temple, the assassins needed to find Juno and decipher her next move to continue to monitor the Templars. The assassins, depleted, used whatever assets they could, and in John, they found one. Why he worked with the assassins is not clear. We take who we can get. But in us, they have another asset. And we still have the access given to us by John. Have the resources to pay you like the Templars do, but we'll make it worth your while. Finding out about and helping stop the Templars is payment enough. Our work here at Abstergo continues. As the assassins regroup in their new home of Great Inagua, Edward comes to terms with everything he has been, everything he is now, and everything he is to become. He started his journey nine years ago, a scared, clueless, shameful boy. But in the world he found here, and the people that helped shape him, he has become much more than the man of quality he hoped to be. He is now a man for those outside of himself, giving himself to the care, freedom, and safeguarding of others. His work is to start in earnest now, with a new guest to the island. She is arriving here to be with Edward, travelling from her home in Bristol. But it's not Caroline. His wife he left due to his shame and inadequacies all those years ago because the letter received in the observatory made that an impossibility. Caroline grew ill from smallpox, was not given adequate care by her father Emmett Scott and died. But she left behind a part of herself and a part of Edward, the child they made before he left. Edward did not know he was a father, but does now, and he will cherish the peace of Caroline he has left, the woman he failed. As she stands here now, Edward knows he will not fail Jenny. Edward returned to London a man of means. He invested in business and in the cause of the assassins. He got his revenge on the Templars that hurt him and his family before he left, and the father-in-law that failed his wife. He married and had another child, Haytham, who he loves, but would never get the chance to mentor. 
to teach about the ways of the assassins like Mary Reed and Atabai taught him. Edward died aged 42 in 1735. But he died a man of differing colours, for in life he no longer flew a black flag. He sailed under the banner of the assassins, no longer a jackdaw, now an eagle. To be continued. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to my patrons for supporting this series. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be informed of the next instalment in the series, Assassin's Creed Rogue, coming soon. If you'd like to watch the story of Rogue one month before anyone else, ad-free, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon in the link below. With enough support, I hope to make this channel my full-time career and focus on making quality and engaging content for you. See below for essential must-watch playlists like my videos on Red Dead Redemption, The Last of Us, and other lore videos of the Assassin's Creed series. And if you are watching this well after release, I shall put the next video in this series right here. I'm the Patient Wolf, and this has been the story of Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag.